Thanks, Sue. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, we've, as we said, we've had some technical difficulties today. Uh, Hugh is with us. Um, unfortunately, his camera's not working, so you can't see him today. So, on behalf of myself and Hugh, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. Um, we, we're going to be taking it in turns uh, to go through the the slides. So you'll hear a bit from me, and then you'll hear a bit from Hugh. So. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, RISM membership and how to apply for fellowship. So firstly, as a reminder, or to put everything into context, um, for those of you who are not already members, I thought I'd start with a little bit about who we are. So our members are not just health and safety and environmental people, nor are they simply experts in quality, sustainability or governance. Instead, they work in all fields at every level. So we support people from those just starting out in their careers to those already leading the way. So we believe that having an inclusive and diverse community provides much re richer learning and networking opportunities. So we provide practical education, resources, sharing of experience and networking to help people and organisations identify and manage risk to succeed in the many challenges they face. To help you develop professionally and personally and to achieve your career aspirations. We believe all our members play a vital role in bringing integrated risk decision making into their organisations, helping to keep people safe, healthy and resilient. So we have five different levels of membership here at RISM and they run through from student membership, which is free to anybody studying a risk related subject, through to fellowship which is our highest and most prestigious level of membership. So fellowship is um, at a strategic level. And at fellow level, we are looking for you to combine strategic insight, risk expertise and business acumen and put the well-being of your people at the forefront to drive both individual and organisational performance. So fellowship, this is the membership level that we're going to be looking at today. So we have broadened, so RISM have broadened our routes to membership as we recognise that we don't all have access to the same learning opportunities or take the same career pathways. So depending on our geographical location and the type of size, the type and size of, of the organisation that we work for, we all have access to, to different things. However, we believe everyone should have the opportunity to join and benefit from being part of the professional community and progress through our membership structures as their risk and leadership skills evolve. Qualifications are important and they demonstrate an individual's knowledge. However, they don't always reflect um, how they apply that knowledge to their ever um, evolving experiences. As well as keeping the qualification route um, as, as a way to join as, as a member, we have introduced a competency-based route, enabling people to join or upgrade based on their qualifications and or demonstrating their skills and experience. Um, we, we map those, those, those competencies against our, the WISM competency framework. We will also recognise wider qualification subjects beyond health and safety in recognition of the many roles in, in risk related subjects. So why apply for fellowship? So WISM reflects the expertise, competence and achievements of those responsible for managing risk at a senior level. It also recognises the, the major contributions they have made to their profession and how they have gone over and above their day job to support others. 
fellowship is the pinnacle membership grade of RISM and validates your professional status and competence to employees, employers, customers, regulators, clients and other stakeholders. As a fellow, you can access a network of peers and build contacts and to learn from, share experiences and challenges, take opportunities to raise your profile and showcase your expertise, influence best practice through meaningful volunteering opportunities within RRSM and use the FIIRSM designatory letters. As part of being a fellow, RRSM asks you to commit to supporting and promoting RRSM and its members. There are many ways to do this. Um, one of the examples is through mentoring. So as a fellow of RRSM, um, we ask you to commit to supporting and promoting um, members. There are many ways to do this. As I said, um, mentoring is one of them. Uh, so here we have an example of our mentoring relationships crossing global boundaries. So for example, our mentee here, uh, Kareem is based in Egypt and his mentor is based in the UK. So they, they both learned a huge amount from each other, um, especially as they were from different industries, countries and at different stages within their career. So over to you, Hugh. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Sue, for organising this. I am that technical hitch. I do apologise. So first and foremost, I've been associated with RRSM since the 1990s. I'm very proudly to do so. So I've come along this journey, which Don, Don has quite nicely shared, <coughs> which we simplified to try and encourage risk, occupational health, safety, insurance, fire professionals, anywhere from any walk of life to come and join us. And as you can see, in terms of the eligibility that we offer you now, there are three actual routes to becoming a member. The first of which really is more of the traditional way where you've actually been a member or a specialist member for a minimum of three years and you can demonstrate five years in the career, in the, uh, the actual, in the career, supporting your risk management needs. So it's important up on top of this, you've worked consistently at a senior level. Now, a senior level doesn't mean that you're going to be Richard Branson. It's got to mean that you're going to be in a position where you've been able to influence either a small or medium sized enterprise, private, public or whatever. And you've not only been involved in the operational side, but you've been helping to develop the strategy for that business. And I think over the past couple of years with COVID, more of us have had more involvement and more engagement in strategic development than we actually appreciate sometimes. Route two. Route two is more of a quasi or semi traditional way where we're looking for somebody coming in with a, a risk related bachelor's degree at honours level or a master's qualification <coughs> or conversely a qualification that's recognised on the uh, NCQ level six or you can be a chartered member or fellow of, another, of a related recognised professional body for example the most common one being the Institute of Risk Management or our good friends IOSH plus again having this five years of demonstrable relevant experience working at a senior level or route three which is particularly one I, i'm keen on nowadays i think a lot of people who are not academic or academically biased feel much more comfortable and don't take it take advantage of this enough you don't necessarily need to have a risk a formal risk qualification or professional membership but if you've been out there making a difference making a positive demonstrable um, difference with nine years experience at a senior level then this is the opportunity for you to come along and take advantage. Lovely. So, this one for me, Donna, my friend, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So it's important. We, we don't just, I'll be quite honest with you, I'm, I am so proud to be a fellow of WRSM and being chair of the fellowship panel, it's important that we're consistent for our members at all level, at other levels. So we don't just give this fellowship away willy-nilly. We expect people to meet some sort and certain key areas of competence and also to follow some rules going forward. So it's important that you meet the five technical competencies 
and meet six leadership competencies. <coughs> Excuse me. Now these aren't as difficult as people first think when they see the, the actual application form, but equally important there where people get merit towards their fellowship is that you maintain up to date continuing professional development, which if you're doing it already for another professional body, for example, IOSH, IRM, uh, you may be doing it because for fire risk assessment or other qualifications or, and statuses you hold, you can use that rather than reinventing the wheel. But we also ask you to supply some additional information as well, which is, I like this, this is a really sexy slide, isn't it? <laughs> the application form. And one of the benefits of WIRSM is you don't have to hit face to face. We respect you, we respect the references that are given you. So you don't have to go through the, the heavy grinning that some uh, fellowship panels do to get to, for you to achieve the fellowship level. Obviously, a copy of an up-to-date CV, which gives us a better understanding of you and your work environment and some of the achievements and the road to where you are now in terms of your fellowship application. And references. Of your references, ID, we'd like one to be one, a member or a fellow WRSM or somebody who can give that experience um, if they can. Ideally as well, we want one of them to be your employer so they can validate what's going on. But equally important is that you share with us PDF or file copies or photos of your certificates in order that we can validate and make sure that there's consistency there. As I said, it's the important thing is that we're consistent to all of our members and that we're consistent in the fellowship process and approval process. Lovely, thank you. Okay, so we provide you with um, lots of support to try and help you get through the um, application process. So as well as the application form, there are several documents um, to help support you with, with the process. So the first one is the, the fellowship assessment guidelines. So this will help you to judge whether you're eligible to apply and assist with completing the application form. And it also details the scores for each section of the application form, which Hugh will talk about in, in more detail later. Um, you've also got, um, we've, prov we've produced a reference request letter. Uh, so you can send this letter out to your referees to request the references. Um, and this can be accompanied by the reference application form that we we produce for you as well. So lastly, you've got the WISM Risk Management and Leadership Competency Framework document. So this is where we are looking for you to map uh, your your experiences give give examples of what you've you've done at a strategic level so when you look through this document you're looking at the last column which is the um strategic level competencies so we launched this uh competency framework about two years ago and what we've done is we set the expectations of what it means to be a competent person and to identify, manage and communicate risk in what, whatever, whatever its form. So these, these competencies underpin the criteria to be a member and our training and development activities as well. Um, so we purposely developed the, the framework with competencies that presented in a generic way to enable users to apply their own, to it to apply it to their own areas of work, recognizing that there are many people working in risk from different industries and geographical location, so that it just helps to provide a bit more flexibility and makes it a little bit more inclusive um, to help you become part of IRSM. So next we're on to how to complete the application form. So you can submit an application form at any time. Uh, the, the fellowship application process will usually take about six to eight weeks, uh, but it may take slightly longer at busy times of the year, but we'll let you know when you, when you send your application in. So the application form itself is made up of several mandatory sections so before completing your application, make sure you review 
the risk management and leadership competency framework and understand that the strategic fellowship level competencies that we need you to meet and just just so that you are, you are aware that each section of the application form is scored so sections one to four that you can see on screen now ask for your personal details including your membership number if you already have one um, all applications must be typed um, and use the application form provided we don't set we don't accept kind of anything uh, any applications that are not on this form and all sections and relevant supporting documentation are mandatory except for section 11 but we'll cover that in in more detail later um, as I said if you're a current member you need to include your membership number um, and you must ensure that you've completed two references on the the form supplied So next, the next section, section five, asks you to select which route you're applying for. So as Hugh explained, we have um, three different routes. So you will just select which route you are applying through. Section six of the application requires you to list your qualifications and professional membership. Um, most most applicants already have this information recorded in their CV so it's just a case of copying and pasting it over so again it's not too onerous uh, to have to kind of work through and think about what you need to put in this section you've probably already got it in your CV okay so the next the next part is the statement of professional competence so Hugh I'm going to hand back over to you now that's a bit tough, Donna. You got the easy bit. I get the I get the snazzy bit. Eh? <laughs> no, thank you. Now the important thing is, right? Again, it's a statement of your professional competence, and as Donna's quite rightly shared with you, some fantastic documents there. Not only showing you what our expectations are for you to hit the hit the actual mark when it comes to strategic thinking compared to operational thinking, but it actually lists and defines what the five technical and six leadership competence areas require. Now, it gives you a range of technical and leadership competencies, and it's up for you to determine which of those best fits your knowledge, skills, and experience within risk management and within your business and your current role. Now, you can play this back for a few years as well, but one of the biggest shortfalls I see when we do the actual applications people don't sell themselves enough in, in, in this actual section. They don't give us enough detail. And as Donna quite rightly said, section six, you receive up to four points for your qualifications. And we do the actual assessment on a points basis. Now here, the greatest weighting, which we'll talk about later, is actually within the five technical and six leadership competencies for which one we, we award up to two points. And we try to get you to score a minimum of about 18 points, I believe it is off the top of my head so it's important you sell yourself here and we ask people to try and apply the star principle in terms of discussing a situation in which they faced a specific problem and where they've had to actually go into there and basically look at what the task entailed look at how to apply themselves to it to get the end result and to try and share something of the storyline there so I'm hoping everybody's familiar with the star principle yeah, we're covering it. We've got, a, we've got a slide okay. in, a, in, a, in a I'll minute. leave that then. Yeah. Okay. So, so really, get as much detail in here as you can on each of these examples. I said sometimes people just say, refer to refer to CV. We can't give you points for that. We want to learn about you. We want to make sure that we've got rounded professionals there and make sure that you, you hit the boxes for us and for our members as a fellow, because ultimately you're going to be influencing others. So try and get as much detail in there as you can. If If not, when you've got people doing your references or if you've got a mentor, talk through with them what you think you're going to put in there. It's a really important part of the process. And as I said, really, if you look at this section, more than 50% of the marks that you need, not 50% of the top marks, but if you get a good score on this on this here, if you get full marks on this section here, you've got more than 50% of the marks you need to get yourself above water for a fellowship. 
it. So, um, okay. so just so do you want me to elaborate? Or do you, do you want yeah, you could, I'll let you elaborate on this one. It's just showing yeah, the actual. Sorry. So I'm really pleased. I intentionally spent more time on that before we expose you to the technical competencies, because what usually happens when I've mentored people in the past, when I talk about technical competencies, there's a sharp intake of breath, or there's a, a sudden look of a look of scare, of fear in the face. They're not there to challenge you. They're there just to really try to get a feel of technically, what do you understand in terms of your organizational context? What do you understand in terms of the role of risk management, strategic objectives and more? And as you see across the box, we go from what our minimum expectations would be for you to satisfy an associate membership level, the membership level and the fellowship level. So ultimately, we're hoping that you've progressed in your career, stepping from the first, the second box into what we're looking for in terms of fellowship. Now, this has been particularly close to my heart over the past couple of weeks because my son actually achieved his NEBOSH certificate last year. And thanks to my very good friend and a key member of the RRSM team, Raymond, Raymond Suku, he's actually just been accepted at associate level. So before he actually said, you know, well, Dad, you know, do you think I'm ready to, to apply for this? I actually sat down with him and said, well, look, let's have a look at what the, the associate competencies uh, cover and do you feel in your current role they're covering this now fortunately he's joined a fantastic company he's a small business it's his first role in safety and going through together he feels he ticks the box already but i've got him into that mindset now thinking about progression i think that's important and in particular as leaders never more important has it been the behaviors that we excel and whether so that we we actually show and we excel in and try to improve in and i'm trying to improve every day because none of us are perfect and we've all got things to work upon so this gives us when it comes to influencing for example or emotional intelligence it gives us some yardsticks or some milestones where we feel we should have moved and progressed from towards what we're looking for as a fellow Brilliant. so i know words actions speak louder than words so when it comes to section seven actually competing uh, the the actual state the actual uh, statement of professional competence we want you to give it your best shot. We don't know you anywhere near as well as you know yourself and your experiences. So please humor us and please, as simple as you can, or as structurally and detailed as you can, apply the STAR principle here, as I said, the situation, the task. Some people say approach. I don't, I like to think more of achievements. Because so I like to thought, put the, you know, like anything, put the positive spin on it before you hit them with the punchline with the results. So try and build that up in a storyline if you can, because you know what you've achieved and be proud of it. And whether it's in terms of the organizational context and your role in risk management, it may be the fact that the business had nothing five years ago about in terms of risk management understanding. Maybe that you've come along and highlighted what the significant risks of the business, financial, non-financial, operational, you know, and you've actually influenced that. So don't be scared to tell your story. Whether you're head of, whether you're department leader or whatever, in a bigger business, how you've worked to influence, to work with others, to make and shape the business needs in terms of the role of risk management or in terms of whatever the actual area of behavior is. Try and basically look at what you've done and what you've achieved. Map that against what our expectations are at a strategic level for fellowship and try and write your storyline that way. And whilst it sounds difficult, when you do it for the first, for the second, particularly the technical competence, I think people find tough to get their head around sometimes, it starts to flow then. That's why I like it, the fact that we put the, the, the tough bit first, the technical competencies, and what you'll find is when you start writing about the behaviors as opposed to the competencies, it's flowing already. And so in many cases, there's something of a storyline because what you're actually sharing is an experience with us about your actual um, technical competencies. The examples can actually be actually pitched further and developed upon with what you give us in terms of your behaviors. So you find it's a virtuous circle and the two, one feeds into the other. So don't be put off, see it's the opportunity. And again, not so not dismissing other, other organizations, but if you're applying for something like the Chartered Management Institute, or you're applying for fellowship of IOSH and people later, I can assure you this is a much user-friendlier route, but it also allows you to establish a, a bit of self-esteem about, yes, am I ready for it or not? And as I said, a lot of people, particularly over the past couple of years, have had to step 
step up their game when it comes to risk management to support their businesses and the workplaces. So this for me is a great time for you to have a look at a bit of self-reflection and try and put together a good strong fellowship petition. Brilliant. Yeah. And as you can see on the on the screen as well, we do provide a couple of examples. Um and we, you know, we understand, I think your your um um testament to this, uh, Hugh, that you actually find that when you're writing about one area, you actually cover in a couple, um, because the examples that you give actually feed into other uh, strategic competencies as well. Donna's totally right there as well. And don't be scared to do that. Because at the end of the day, you know, none of us walk around like robots and we've got a great team of assessors. The fellowship panel are absolutely brilliant. Great, great team. We're looking to expand them more, make them more diverse, make them more inclusive. Uh, thanks to Raymond again. And they understand they've came through this, so, this path and they understand that there'll be overlap. So please don't be scared if there is overlap. Lovely. Thank Good you. Good point, Donna. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so this next section, section A of the application, this can be used to um, demonstrate how you've uh, contributed to your profession and gone above and beyond to help colleagues or organisations outside of your paid employment. So, um, some of the examples that you, you could give is that you've mentored, um, you've done some unofficial mentoring for a friend or a colleague, um, maybe you've, as part of what, what you do, um, you've provided some free consultancy or, um, you know, you might be volunteer uh, for a committee or um, one of the groups. I know Sir Kareem, who we saw um, as part of the mentoring earlier in the presentation, he's actually the branch chair for the Egypt branch. So that's how he gives his contribu contribution back. Um, have you got any other examples, um, Hugh, for Donna, how people could go above and beyond? You picked some great examples there, and I'm so pleased that you actually mentioned my friend Kareem. <laughs> I had the pleasure of representing WRSM in Egypt at an oil and gas conference. Kareem and the team there, a great bunch of people, they put the stand up. Uh, and what you'll find, once you know, I mean, if you're not doing it already, please network as much as you can to Blarius. And we've got so many great people around the world to meet. There's things, I mean, a lot of people take things for granted. If you're a school governor, if you're doing things with um, local football teams, I mean, I, I help out occasionally doing risk assessments for the local football team, help the, help the guys and girls there. It's well structured now. So don't call on my services much at all. But anything you're doing over and above, um, for example, through COVID, I was called upon by a number of small businesses around here, trying to help them out, putting their policy together to make sure they didn't get in trouble and had the right controls in place. Any little thing like this that you've done over the past few years that you can share, you know, that something should be, well, past five years, sorry, that you're proud of, it's probably a lot more out than you think. If you do any voluntary work, if you do any fundraising, um, for example, Grant Thompson, great guy, he does a lot of work in terms of um, the Heart Foundation, raising money, raising funds, supporting local charities. You know, don't be scared to put that thing down there. It's something that you're proud of, you put your time into, and it helps to reduce the risk profile for somebody else. Then put it down there. The least you can get is marks for it. So please, and it goes towards your fellowship. And sometimes it makes you feel good. And then it actually opens your school of thought. So hang on, I did that as well two years ago. So uh, so don't be scared to put it down there. Brilliant. Sorry, again, if you put any articles together, company magazines, if you've done any events at work, for example, uh, last week was the, the Mental Health at Work Week. If you ran any initiatives at work with your colleagues, um, anything like this, please feel free to share that as examples. Thanks, Hugh. Okay. So um, so for, for Section 9, um, what we've asked for you is to provide evidence of your CPD activities over the last five years. So I think, as, as Hugh mentioned um, earlier, is we do accept um, CPD logs from other um, organisations or from your uh, paid employment. If you keep a CPD log as part of your, your employment, we'll accept that as well. So that can actually be um, provided as an attachment as a separate document so you don't actually have to pop it into this form but if you're currently already a, a member of double irsm you can use your cpd log in your my double irsm section as well so we're quite happy to accept cpd in any form that you currently have it 
And that's a good point, Donna. But the thing is, I mean, remember, you're getting points against this. We do ask people to put at least four of the last five years, if possible. I'm sorry, five of the last six years, if possible, I think it is. You get points awarded for each year and one or two little ditties isn't the CPD. We want it continuing. So we'd like to see a bit, a little bit regular, which has added to your development. And don't be scared to put courses in that you've studied. If you've been on an EBOSH diploma, if you've been on an environmental awareness course, fire safety, work, put these things in, they all count. As does attending little webinars like this, which hopefully add some value to you and your personal development. So put it down there. If you don't have the, the you know, the regular, the structured, structured stuff already, because I find sometimes people haven't done CPD before find this bit a little bit daunting as well. Yeah. So the next section, well, we we are asking you to um, demonstrate how you intend to promote double RSM. So in in the future, so this could be through your workplace. Um, this could be through a corporate partnership with WISM, through connecting with your local branch or promoting WISM to your contacts. So as a, as a membership organisation, member contributors are at the centre of what we do. So this, can, this section can include some information that you've already included as part of Section 8. So if it is that you're promoting um, a double RSM, you can actually uh, include that in this section as as well. Um, have you got any any thoughts on any thoughts on that, Hugh? My friend, no. I think Donnie, I think summed it nicely. But again, we're double RSM. We're diverse. We're looking for people to come in with fresh ideas, with new ideas, bounce things off, and share things. I get a big buzz out of reading, and perhaps sometimes too much contributing to the Sentinel. It's a great publication. So things like if you haven't done it already, putting your views in, putting letters in, offering to put articles in. Uh, we've got many branches around the country. You've got many branches setting up around the world. Equally, if you want to get involved in the branch networking in the future, that's a great way for you to share your experiences and learn from others and interact with double ISM. Um, as I said, there's a lot of courses, conferences. A lot of them, such as this, obviously have been remote because of COVID. These things are changing. So going forward, I always believe that you get out of double RSM what you put into it. And in this case, if you're prepared to put into these things, write down exactly what you can bring to the party for us. We'll give you credit for it. And we'd like to get you engaged because we are evolving, we are emerging, and we are our institute, which I think people understand. It's it's ours, it's for us to shape and us to help help form it with the team. Donna and the great team at Double RSM will work with us. They'll basically give us what we need to prepare us better for the future. And by saying what you want to contribute and support, this allows you to do that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right, Hugh. And so we, we've moved on now. We're moving on now to section 11, which is the personal statement. And I know that, Hugh, you'll have more um, insight into this section than what I do. But your personal statement, it does say it's optional, but I need to make you aware that it does carry points. It does have five points associated with it. Um, so this section can be used to provide any additional information and ed evidence that you believe will support your application and help the fellowship assessment panel in their decision making process. The evidence that you provide in, in this section should be um, within the last five years. And what sort of things would you expect to see in this section, Hugh? What I'd like to see, what I like to see about this, at the end of the day, I like to see this as I wouldn't say closure, but I'd like to see, you know, we get to the last, you know, we get to the, the peak in the book, you know, the last bit, the climax of the book. I like to see this really as put the, the icing on the cake, shall we say, where you put it all together and you can sit there and you can feel proud to yourself of what you've achieved in your career to date and what you've put together. So this gives you the opportunity to to again to self-reflect and to sell yourself in terms of what have you done that makes you feel well basically from the heather small song what have you do, done today that makes you feel proud you know put it down there we'll give you the marks and the credit and allows us to get a better understanding of you and an individual and your contribution to risk in your environment so don't be scared to write about yourself about what you've done there may be elements of things that are confidential we don't expect you to go into great detail or, or give any sort of government information away that's classified but sit, don't be scared to put down what you feel makes you stand out 
or what makes your ace stand out for the way you've performed in terms of risk management? Brilliant. Okay, so we're on to the, we're nearly at the end of the application form. So we're at the reference um, section now. So we, um, we ask you to provide two references. Um, the forms, as I said before, are provided and your references should provide evidence of good character and professionalism, um, an awareness of your personal and professional achievements, uh, strategic professional knowledge, experience and influence and demonstrate uh, as demonstrated as part of your application and a recommendation for fellowship. So one reference must be from your current employer uh, or your manager or a client uh, and based uh, on the last three, if you working with them in the last three years. Um, the other could ideally be from a current IRSM fellow or someone who is equally qualified and experienced. Um, so each reference must be dated within the last uh, 12, 12 months. Okay, and then just moving on to the last section, which is just to sign and date your form. So um, it's 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 you're signing to the to state that you um, uh, signing to comply with the declaration and uh, to say that the information that you've provided is truthful and correct. Um, so you need to ensure that it is signed and dated before you send it off to us. So. Once we receive your application, so we'll send it to the assessment panel and that will be obviously Hugh's, Hugh's team. Um, you'll need to get a maximum score of 40, but I'll let Hugh talk more about um, the scoring process and how it works. Thanks, Donna. So that's why we've shared it with you. We try to be as fair, impartial and consistent as we can, not just to the people who are applying, but obviously to our members because you know, we've got to be consistent and we do like to see the progression within the actual uh, institute as well because it's really important that people feel they're achieving things in, in, in life and achieving milestones and the level of membership reflects that. So as you said, very nicely put together. It's it's a great it's great to follow with more practice than we actually can. We're trying to assign as many marks as we can for you. So if you don't get it down in paper, then we can't give you. So as Donna's quite rightly said, the magic number is 40 and if you can acquire 40 points or more then basically what happens is we have a number of assessors four people assess each panel and if you get the thumbs up from all four then basically you're approved for fellowship and you get a lovely letter from a wonderful gentleman Raymond Suku our membership services officer and he will introduce you to your fellowship and then sort everything out there for you now usually if it's 3-1 in terms of the, the marks that marks appointed by each person because each person from different backgrounds and each person reads and tries to assess it in their own right and if it's three one in favor then yes you still pass if it's in doubt or, or or split decision then that's usually where i get involved or if it's three one in the or four four nil in the favor that you won't be approved that's when it gets escalated to me and that's when i have to really pull what little bit of hair i've got out left trying to assign as many marks as possible to see if we can get you above the the 40 marks but the important thing is you try and get yourself as many marks as possible as you can see from the criteria here education there's up to four marks we took put two points per completed qualification if you can put yourself two pieces of qualifications down there you've got 10 percent of that 40 marks the magic 40 you need already i'm going to ignore section seven for now because that's the big banker Right. Look at section eight. We've gone above and beyond. We are giving you two points for every every time you can tell us how you contributed above and beyond, right? In your profession, with your colleagues, organizations. So as I said to you, four good examples there of where you've contributed above and beyond. You've got eight marks there. So that's that's another that's another twenty percent of the marks you need to get that magic well, it's twelve points at the magic forty. Continuing C P D, two points for each year. In CPD, I like to see at least five, six, seven examples and of regular progression. But again, if you've been doing something like a master's degree or an MVQ, that obviously tells, takes a lot of time and a commitment. So we can give you two points for each year there. 
five of the last six years. So it's there for you to get those points. There's 10 points potentially there as well. That's 25% of the, the marks that you need. Um, when it comes to section 10, there's up to, you know, there's two points per example of how you contributed already. One point examples how you want to promote and support WISM in the future. So if you're going to basically get out there, run events where you're marketing us, you're going to start writing articles and sharing for the for the uh, Crucible. You're going to start doing your bit in terms of promoting ISM. You get the point for all of these things. Personal a statement, writing and blowing your own trumpet. As Donna quite rightly said, there's five marks there for just you telling us your story and how you progressed in risk and what makes you feel you're a standout, what makes you proud of what you've achieved. And then back to the references, section 12, 10 points there, 25% of the marks again. The reference one, I try and ensure when I talk to the people who do the references, ask somebody to, to state that you have good character and that you're professional in what you do. Ask them to share one or two of your professional achievements that are standouts. Ask them to say that you've got the knowledge, experience and skills and influence to do that. And we can't take the marks away from you. If they put that in the statement and on the second statement as well, why should you be a fellow? Ask them to say why they believe. Ask them to validate your professional achievements. Ask them to say you're a good character and, and not just in your workplace, but beyond your place of work and that you, you walk and talk what we'd expect of being a fellow. And that's all the marks. And that's before we come to the things that tell us really about how you do it in the workplace. So these are some of the what's or some of the backgrounds. And when we look at section seven, as I said, by applying that star for each of the five competencies and for each of the six leaderships, you can get yourself to this magic 22 points. It's not as hard as people think. And as I said, the first one or two when you start writing them may seem a bit difficult, but thereafter it tends to flow. So as I said, sometimes it's quite tough for us to try and award it because it's borderline. So I'll get the CV out and I'll go through and I've got the highlighter trying to look for examples that fit into the bits where we don't think we've got the, the core competencies. But the best stab you can have at it, if you don't hit if you don't hit the mark the first time, then we will work with you to try and make sure that you do hit the mark. We'll identify, I'll send you, I mean, if you get the Dear John letter from me, it's not all bad news, so please don't think it is. It's usually a case that I'll identify where we feel we need some bit more information from you, that we can validate your claim and do you justice as well as doing our own assessment process justice. So we'll make them back to you and say that you've not given me enough on statements and professional competence or your reference doesn't say enough about this, but we'll be specific with you in terms of what our expectations are, allowing you to actually submit that information afterwards. Yeah, brilliant. So just just a little bit about um, the fee. So we've covered the application form and the application um, part of the application process. So the next section is the fees. So we asked for a £95 application fee prior to us sending your application to the assessment panel. So we can take that payment over the phone um, or you can do a bank transfer for that payment. So once your um, application has been approved, you will, if you're a current member, you will pay the higher rate of fellowship, your fellowship renewal rate at the next time you um, renew. If you're a new member, then we will take the fellowship um, annual fee at the time that you, you get ex uh, accepted. So any any comments on the fee, um, Hugh? How, I certainly have, Donna. Possible? Donna, I think it's the best value for money. I'm a, I'm a fellow of IOSH, I'm a fellow of WRSM, for the different reasons, for my, my professional reasons, I get equally a lot out of them. I'm also a fellow of the Institute of Leadership and Management and a fellow of the Charter Management Institute. When you get to near retirement age, you know, these, these are things that you've earned over the years, I promise you. But I'll be honest, you, and I'm not just saying this to the audience, for this £95 fee and for the cost of fellowship, I know of no other institute that gives us the same value, value add that we get from WRSM. And that's why I try and give back as much as I can not just sort of in terms of events like this. I really do think it's value for money. And I really do think it's not having those letters. It's not the fact, but it's it's the road to how you got there sometimes. It reflects the fact that, you know, you're recognised by your peers, you're recognised by a really professional institute to having achieved this accolade. And I think sometimes a lot of people out there don't recognise this. And as Donna knows, I'm a big adversary in making, I'm a big, a big adversary in diversity and inclusion. And not just in terms of the membership, 
and grades, you know, whatever grade you are, I'm happy to help you with your mentoring development. But I want to see that diversity inclusion with more females coming on board, with more people coming on board from the developing countries. We do a lot of mentoring and support. And also in terms of the fellowship assessors, we've got a great team of fellowship assessors but because of work reasons. We're actually down now to a core of about, I think it's nine people at the moment without myself. Keith Scott, Carla Khan, uh, Abdul Latif, uh, Albito Owe, I think I presented to pr pronounce that right. I have trouble. Uh, Cameron Miller, Robert Mawson, Ian Pickard, David Riel, Richard Price, Edward Brazier. As you notice there, we haven't got enough females in there. We haven't got enough people around the, around the world. So that's another area that I'm working on very hard with my good teams and the RSM uh, team there to get this diversity. But please come along, come and join us and come and do your bit. It's great value for money. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And that's a good point you made there, Hugh, in that, you know, if if anybody is interested in, in being an assessor, obviously you need to be a, be a, 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 a fellow member. Um, but yeah, we're also always looking for people to come on board as assessors as well. And also the mentoring scheme as well. It's a fantastic mentoring scheme. I said I've mentored for years with Grant and with others. It's a two-way thing, it's a partnership. It's, you know, it's not mentor mentee anymore. And so please come along and get involved. You'll get a lot out of it. Yeah. Yeah. So just a just a quick recap of the um, application process. So you commit, complete and submit your application form. Um, your application form will be reviewed by a, a member of the, the membership team. So we'll ensure that you've completed all the sections and that um, everything that we need is included. So we will, we will work with you to make sure that your application um, is of, uh, it's covered everything that the, the assessors will need. Um, so we will only send your application once um, we're, we're happy that we've, we've got all of the, we've got everything and that once the payment has been made. So then your application will be uh, submitted to the fellowship panel uh, for a detailed review. Um, so as, as Hugh mentioned, um, the, the panel is an independent panel um, and um, they will mark it against the criteria that we, we discussed previously. Um, and then once uh, everything has been um, approved, you'll get your decision notification and um, we will then be able to welcome you on board as a fellow. So that brings me to the end of uh, today's presentation. So, um, you know, we, WISM are really keen to uh, ensure that risk uh, safety professionals who are currently not part of our, our global community have the opportunity to join and benefit from our products, our initiatives, our services, as well as being part of a local branch network. So you can find all the information that you need to, to become a fellow from the um, website on, on screen. And if you need to um, speak to anybody, um, we do have a dedicated mailbox, which is fellowship at rrsm.org. So you can email me, you can email Raymond, you can email Hugh all on, on that um, email address. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully, I hope to welcome some of you on board as fellows very soon. You got any 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 comments, um, Hugh? No, just a big thank you to WRSM, but primarily to your good self, Donna, and to Sue for all the hard work putting this together. As I said to you, I've been I said I've been associated since the 1990s. WRSM became a fellow in 2007, and I think the work now that WRSM are doing, in particular, promoting not just fellowship, but with things like mentoring, the Sentinel. We've always been a great organisation. Sorry, we've always been a strong, good organisation, but I think we've gone from great towards world class, thanks to people like your good selves. So I think, you know, please, if you can get involved, if you're not ready for fellowship now, it shouldn't deter you from coming along and joining us. But it'd be interesting to see how many of you good people and this webinar and also from the recording afterwards are prepared to actually bite the bullet and apply for fellowship. So as Donna said, come on. Get your head out, head out of the parapet and come on, we'll help you. Yeah, we will help, definitely help. Brilliant.
So is okay, there any well, questions? You. Yes, there are. So thank you, uh, Hugh and Donna, for such an interesting and informative session. So we do have some questions. A lot of them are focused around CPD, routes into fellowship, but also around references as well. So in no particular order, let's let's, let's <laughs> kick off. Um, so the first question is with regards to routes into fellowship. Um, how do IIRSM access senior level? Does this need to be a job, a job title with senior stated? No, it's basically we judge everyone on their own merits. As I said, you might be, uh, we're not expecting everybody to be Richard Branson. You might be the, the leading person in a company of five or six people or even smaller. The fact is you're actually influencing the strategic direction of that business when it comes to risk management. We'll judge each one on its own merits. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, sorry, it could very um, well be a department even. You know, we're not looking for, we're not expecting everybody to be up there with the, you know, the FTSE 100 companies uh, as yet. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I generally say is we're just, look, we're looking for people to, who are making decisions at strategic level. Um, so it might be somebody who owns their own business. You know, uh, you know, you, if you if you're self-employed, you make all of the decisions at strategic level. So you know, you'd be a perfect candidate to to apply. Very good point, Donna. Okay, thank you. Um, so how can the references cover the last three years if you've changed job within that time? This person has just started a new job in the last six weeks, so a reference from that employer won't be able to show that. So do they then use a previous employer as a referee? That's a good one. We've not come against that one. I think if you've got the works history there and we know that it's recent, we'd take that into consideration. I don't think we'd see that as a problem on, on that very basis. I'd have to yeah, phone a friend. I'd have to phone Raymond on that one, but I think I'd probably give me the same answer. Yeah, it would be fine. It would be it would be fine. So yes, definitely use your your current employer as 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 an employee an employer reference. Um, but you know, as Hugh says, we take each case as a, on its individual merit. So um, that wouldn't be a problem at all. And uh, another question to do with references is how um, how can a more mature person obtain references? You mean an old bugger like me? Excuse my French. The thing is, I mean, to be honest with you, it's again, it depends, on, it depends on the merit as well. If it's somebody you know, for example, if it's somebody you're working with, you can use that. If you've got somebody in your network who's a member of the RSM or another international organisation at a senior level who knows you and can validate what you've said, Somebody who can basically, somebody we know is, is, can confirm your credentials uh, and we know is of a reasonable standing to be able to do that. We're trying to be consistent. We're not trying to catch you out. We just want to make sure we're consistent for our members and for you as well. Yeah. It could be a client even. Even yeah, if client, you're working yeah. with someone, um, they, could, yeah, they could provide you with the reference as well. Just hope they don't and try and cut your prices, though. That's it. <laughs> and is there a time limit on that sort of working with that that person? So if it's a client that you've worked with, say, six years ago, or does it have to be more recent? I think I think it says up to three years. Up to um, three years, I, I believe. Yeah, yeah I believe I it's more recent for integrity. I think you know, so you know, something that is valid and is quite current. I think that's probably the best bit. That's what we're looking for, really. But again, yeah. I'd phone a friend like Donna or Raymond to to sort that one out. So we do try and be fair in each case. Yeah. So the the answer then is is finding and choosing those referen those those uh, referees very carefully that they can actually validate what you are saying. Absolutely, Sue. So. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think I'm going to answer. I know what the answer is to this question: is uh, can a uh, CMI OSH individual with numerous years of experience be a referee? Yes. I wouldn't hold that against him. Of course he would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I used to be a referee when I was well, when I was CMI, I used to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's absolutely fine. Okay. Um, and this is a question about CPD. Um, they don't have any CPD, particularly with IIRSM, but they have CPD from other organisations. Um, and how could they meet the CPD requirement in time to apply for a fellowship this year? Just share your history going back the past uh, up to the past six years. And I said two points per year CPD. Share it. We don't discriminate, as Donna quite rightly said. We can use whatever in that international institute or whoever you've got working for your business, your company, anything. We will we'll, we'll accept that as long as it's consistent, as long as it hits all the criteria in terms of being CPD. Yeah. 
yeah and again it's 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 any form so you know if it's if it's not in a downloadable form take screenshots drop it into word we'll, we'll you know as long as we can see that evidence that you've been recording cpd that that will be fine and we'll accept it and how about the sort of more informal ad hoc cpd that somebody might actually uh, engage with how how might they go about recording that and evidencing that I think use the form in the application. Um, I think that's probably the best way to demonstrate um, kind of informal CPD. Yes. Use the, app, the the section in the application form and just make a note of when those activities took place um, and yeah, what they got out of them. Okay, thank you. And um, final question for the moment is: uh, Would you really advise having a mentor who has who is already a fellow? to actually help you go through this process. I'll let Absolutely. you answer that, Hugh. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it'll make it much, much less painful, painful for the person involved, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And the 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 actual um the actual oh. process isn't as onerous as it seems. Oh. And you know, if you need to contact me, I'll help you through the process. I help loads of people through the process. So I'm I you know it isn't it, it really isn't as difficult as it seems. But yeah, another fellow will be I'm sure another fellow will be more than happy to help you. Um or you know the team here at Double ISM will help you through the process. You'll find very people people are very supportive in Double ISM and as you said, if Donna doesn't know we don't know, we'll phone a friend within the network and we'll try and sort sort it with you. Yeah. Please okay. excuse me, guys. I'm going to have to venture up. I'm afraid I'm running a little late today. Take care. Please, Thank any you. questions that you need to feel back to me, please do, and I'm, I'm there to help and support anybody on the panel here. Lovely. Thank That's you. Super. Thank Thanks. you, Hugh. I'm just checking to see if we've got any more questions. I don't think we have, so I think we will leave it there for today. Uh, so thank you again, Donna and Hugh, for sharing your knowledge with us about the application process, giving us lots of really good hints and tips about how we can best apply for, for fellowship. Um, thank you to everybody who's joined us this afternoon. Um, they'll put the recording onto the IIRSM YouTube channel either later today or tomorrow, so you'll be able to catch up or recap or anything in your own time. So we'll end the webinar here. Um, have a great rest of the day, and I look forward to seeing you again at the next IIRSM webinar. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sue.